The moment she entered the room, an intense feeling came over me. I knew she was the girl I was going to marry. That's how Ernest Hemingway described his first meeting with Hadley Richardson, uh, the woman who is buried here along with her second husband, Paul Moray. Hadley met Hemingway and Hemingway changed her life. I don't think there's any question about that. Uh, they moved to Paris, to make a long story short, and were there during the time that um, some of the most famous uh, artists of the time, uh, during the 1920s, the post-World War I period, uh, the Lost Generation. It's so interesting to read about her and Hemingway you know, having breakfast with James Joyce, uh, hanging around with uh, F. Scott Burton and Zelda Fitzgerald, um, Gertrude Stein, and many others. Uh, th the intensity of that experience must have been incredible. And the relationship that Hemingway and she had at that time, it was quite obvious that they were very much in love with each other. And I am going to take the liberty of reading a few quotes uh, from the movable feast. I'm lucky enough to have lived in Paris as a young man. Then wherever you go for the rest of your life, it stays for you, for Paris is a movable feast. And I think that movable feast stayed with Hadley as well, uh, right up until the end. And in fact, after Hemingway committed suicide, uh, she still expressed no regrets for the time that she spent with Hemingway and for the time she spent in Paris. We ate well and cheaply and drank well and cheaply and slept well and warmed together and loved each other. That's the woman he's referring to is laying right here. Uh, the other thing that I think says a lot about Hadley and some about definitely about Hemingway as well. Life breaks us all, but some of us get stronger in the broken places. And I don't think there's any question that that uh, says a lot about what Hadley uh, was as a person, that she did go through losing Hemingway to one of her best friends uh, after he divorced her, after he divorced, divorced Hadley and that she took some time, but she went on to find and make another life with Paul Maurer, and which by all accounts was very happy. Uh, one of the things that I was able to uh, access uh, for the writing of this book were the tapes that she made at the end of her life, uh, interviewed by an Alice Hunt Sokoloff, uh, who was a friend of hers, and. Hadley really comes off as a very gracious uh, lady. Uh, she called herself, what did she call herself? Quite a, uh, oh my, I'm sorry, I should have been. Quite a knockout, and I think that's true. Uh, she was a knockout, I think, uh, both uh, how she looked and how she uh, lived her life. Um, and she does mention later how much she loved Paul, and Paul loved her. Uh, but she, I think there's no question that she also definitely loved uh, Hemingway at the time and that he loved her. Um, just one more quote. Um, when I saw her again standing by the tracks as the train came by the piled logs at the station, I wished I had died before I had ever loved anyone but her. Uh, that was maybe one of the true sentences that Hemingway always wished or always his goal was to write because uh, I think he did love her and I think later in life he admitted that she was the one that he should have stayed with uh, and she herself I think at the end of life as I mentioned had expressed no regrets for her time with uh, with Hemingway, uh, but I'll let Paul uh, yeah, Paul I'll let Bill talk a little bit about Paul uh, and the life that she had after Hemingway uh, after she was divorced by Hemingway. 
Well, Paul was uh, quite the man himself. He was no doubt the equal of, of Hemingway in many, many ways. He was a great writer, and he was the poet laureate, the very first poet laureate of New Hampshire. He met Hadley in the spring of 1927, which was shortly after she had divorced Hemingway. They had a five-year courtship. Uh, he was married at that time, too. Uh, and he did divorce his wife, and they were married in London. Um, like Hemingway, he was a far, foreign correspondent, for which he won the Pulitzer Prize for foreign correspondents, the very first time it was awarded. Uh, previous to World War I, he covered the conflict in Croatia, and then during the war, war he ran the Chicago Daily News Paris office and covered World War I from there. Uh, incidentally, his brother, Edgar Ansel, also won a Pulitzer Prize for foreign correspondence. Uh, I think probably in New Hampshire, he is, he is known, you know, obviously he was again the first Port Laureate, right. and uh, that, that's certainly uh, considering in the long line of Port Laureates, and of course, and Frost and, and before them. Um, I'd like to, like to quote from one of his poems. This is a a really nice little book that belongs to Rick, incidentally, and it is, it's a signed copy by Paul. Um, <clears throat> it's called Go Going to Live in New Hampshire, something that I did. <laughs> 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 and the poem, <laughs> coincidentally, is named, I'm Going to Live in New Hampshire. I'm just going to read the last few lines of this. Homesick with years, I crave to live again, where ruffled grouse drum and chickadees feed by, with men who talk my talk and look my look. New Hampshire's hills, the fur-spired lakes of Maine, henceforth are world enough. There's time to try each game trail now and every trouty brook. That kind of resonates with Rick and I, especially that very last line of every trouty brook. For many, many years, we have been devout fly fishermen. And uh, uh, both Paul and Hadley were fly fishermen, uh, like Hemingway. Right? So they carried on the tradition uh, of doing that. I guess the, 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 the big, the striking thing here is, to me anyway, is how a woman who more or less lived the high life after the war and saw Paris and all of its glory uh, after World War I and hobnobbed with all the great writers of that, that era, as well as many of the artists of that era. And yet, uh, she found a life with her second husband, Paul, here in the very small little village of Chakor in New Hampshire, which actually is uh, <clears throat> part of Tamworth. It's kind of a suburb, if you will. I guess. <laughs> Not sure what the population <laughs> is, but I would guess it's like our hometown, probably right around 2,000 or so. So it's a very, very small town, very picturesque. And I, I failed to notice before, but right over behind the camera is Mount Shakur, which just about everybody that ever comes to New Hampshire takes a picture of. It is one of the most beautiful places. And Shakur is an absolutely beautiful little town. So I, they, they found happiness here, and uh, you know, I guess that, that's what, in the end, like the poet says, that's, that's enough. <laughs> it's enough, and I think it's enough for you and I. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm very happy you. that we live here. Uh, just an aside, uh, your wife also was a avid fly <laughs> yes, fisher was. person, <laughs> and I think uh, probably she and Hadley might have gotten along. Oh, I think well. so. <laughs> um, just one other book I think I should mention. Um, is is a book called The Paris Wife, and that's written by Apollo McLean. And I actually finished that, well, I reread it recently. And the interesting thing about that book is it tells, uh, it is, you know, it's obviously an interpretation, but it tells uh, the story of the movable feast, uh, not from Hemingway's point of view, but from uh, Hadley's point of view. So it's kind of an interesting read to put that together with uh, the movable feast. Uh, and we're very uh, happy that we've discovered Hadley ourselves being here in Chicago and that she's in our book, uh, Buried 
New Hampshire. Uh, so I think it's probably time to say goodbye. It is getting kind of cool here. Yes, there's a few <laughs> snowflakes if you haven't noticed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, rest in peace, Hadley and Paul. Rest in peace.